song this morning called Is He Worthy? It's a little bit different format. Uh, you'll notice that some of the words are in bold and some are just in regular print. So the ones in bold are really what you can sing as kind of a response and you can follow the worship team for that. I just think it's such an appropriate text for where we are in our world right now. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new. We do. Let's say that much again. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you 
know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through with you. Do you wish that you could see it all be? all creation groaning it is is a new creation coming it is is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we Oh 
today is from Mark, and it's the, uh, well, I'm not sure the chapter, but the verse is verse 12. It's toward the end, anyway. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room? Where may I eat the Passover from, uh, with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. They're prepared for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, Is it I? And he said to them, It is the one, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping his bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man to have never been born. As they were eating, he took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God, the gospel of the Lord. Children's come forward for the children's sermon. The guest puppeteer is my brother, Eric. He's an ass. <laughs> Did you hear that? What? 
when Pastor was reading from the scripture. Yeah, so he does that every week. I thought he said Jesus knew that someone at the supper was going to betray him. Yes, he knew at the Last Supper. But if he knew, why didn't he kick that bad guy out of the door? That's what you or I would do. You bet. Get rid of that bad guy. God's ways are not our ways. But he knew. He knew. Bella, all people on earth are sinners. That's why God sent his son. So, Jesus didn't do anything about it? Oh, he did something all right. What? Jesus followed God's plan. Followed God's plan? All his disciples were sinners. Jesus knew even Peter would deny him three times that very night. Oh, yeah, that's right. And all his disciples would scatter. Wow. Jesus knew they would. But Jesus knew God's plan was to rescue all the sinners. Somehow, it makes it more real that he knew. Lucky for us, God's ways are not our ways. Thank Jesus for that. Let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. One of your disciples. One of your disciples. Betrayed you, let you down. Betrayed you, let you down. But you went on to save us. But you went on to save us. Spent three days in the ground. Spent three days in the ground. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I'm going to have to edit that out of the... So one Sunday morning, the pastor noticed little Alex staring at the large plaque that hung on the foyer of the church. The plaque was covered with names, and small American flags were mounted on either side of it. The seven-year-old had been staring at the plaque for some time, so the pastor walked up, uh, stood beside him, and said quietly, Good morning, Alex. Good morning, pastor, replied the young man, still focused on the plaque. Pastor Phillips, um, what is this, Alex asked. Well, son, it's a memorial to all the men and women who have died in the service. Soberly, they stood together, staring at, large, at the large plaque. Little Alec's voice was barely audible when he finally managed to ask, which one, the 9 or the 1030 service? <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to talk about... Um, communion. But in order to do that, we're going to have to go way back. And we're going to, I'm going to start with the story of Joseph and the Multicolored Dreamcoat. You ever seen that play or movie? <laughs> you could want to see if you haven't. But you remember, Joseph was the youngest brother of 12 brothers. And I really identify with this story because I had four brothers, who were five of us. And uh, we were constantly beating each other up. I remember I had my younger brother down on the ground, and he was going to go tell mother something, and I hit him. I said, you're not telling mother. I had him pinned down. This is how loving I was. <laughs> and uh, he says, I am too, and I hit him again. And, he, and I said, you're not going to tell mother. And I said, he said, I am too, and I hit him again. And I said, you're not going to tell mother. And by this time, he's crying, crying. Cry. Okay, I won't. And so I said, okay. So I let him up, and he runs up the stairs and goes, Mom! <laughs> and then I hear, David Allen, Valley, David Allen Peterson, you get up here right this minute. <laughs> Should have hit him four times. <laughs> but you can imagine how this brotherly stuff went, and the youngest brother, Joseph, was the spoiled one. He's the one from the marriage that his father, of the woman that his father loved the most. And uh, so he was bragging always, and he comes with this multicolor coat. Now, that doesn't seem like much to us today, but back in the day when, when uh, um, dyes were really expensive, a multicolored coat was very expensive. So he's got this multicolor, and he comes to his brothers who are working out in the field. Now, that should tell you something. This little empty kid's not working, but they are. And, uh, and he says, look what Daddy got me. You know, shows him the coat. And they had just had it. They broke, so they took him. And they throw him in a pit, 
and they uh, took his coat, they tore it to pieces, they put lamb's blood on it, and they brought it to their dad and said, it's been a tragedy, but a lion um, devoured our poor brother, Joseph. And the dad was heartbroken. I mean, just about killed him. Well, later on, they come back to the pit, and they sell their brother into slavery with a train, a, a train of uh, good kind of peop goods, people carrying goods going to Egypt. They sold him to that. So then he gets sold to... Uh, uh, this is also a good story for us who, when we think things are going bad, we might be in God's plan even still. Because things are pretty bad for Joseph now he's been sold to slavery. He gets sold to Potiphar, who is a, um, a military man and in charge of other people. And uh, he is a servant there, and he works his way up in the servant order, becomes the lead servant, and uh, Potiphar really trusts him. The only problem is Potiphar's wife, now this is all in the Bible, right? So this is why you shouldn't let your kids read the Bible. <laughs> but Potiphar's wife has the hots for Joseph and keeps coming on to him over and over again. And he keeps saying, no, this wouldn't be right. You know, I have a master that I serve and I'm not going to do this. And finally she gets upset and she sees her husband coming through the window and she rips her clothes and she goes running out to her husband, Potiphar, and says, Joseph tried to rape me. And so, of course, who are you going to believe? And uh, Joseph goes into prison. So now here's two things that seem kind of bad for Joseph. And uh, he's in prison. And while he's in prison, he has this gift of interpreting dreams. And he uh, interprets all these dreams for all these prisoners. Well, the, uh, the Pharaoh was having a dream at this time of seven fat calves and seven starving calves. And uh, for some reason, the, the, uh, the Pharaoh's baker was in jail for a while, and he had heard about these dreams, and he had known, known Joseph, and, and, the, and Pharaoh couldn't find anybody who could interpret this dream that he kept having over and over again. So finally, uh, the, the baker says to Pharaoh, he says, you know, I know a guy but he's in prison, that he could interpret your dream. And he says, well, bring him here. So here comes Joseph, and he's the guy, he tells him his dream, fat calves, you know, seven fat calves, seven starving calves. And Joseph says, well, you're going to have seven years of great crops, and then you're going to have seven years of starvation. Now, when my brother, my oldest brother, one I did not beat up, um, <laughs> was uh, when Microsoft stock came out, he was smarter than I did. He bought 100 shares right when it came out. I checked it out. Today it's worth about half a million dollars. Not that I'm at all jealous. <laughs> yes. But um, he, he knew, you know, but what if you knew? What if you knew what the stock market was going to do for the next 14 years? How rich could you be? You know, that kind of information is really good. So he has this information. He puts... Joseph in charge of this whole, he's now second in command in Egypt, which is the most powerful country in the world. And he's in charge of this program, and they're building big barns, and they're putting all this food in there, and all this stuff, and uh, the seven years, you know, they're just building all of this stuff up, and then seven years of lean years, and they've got all the food. So guess what? Guess who's coming to them now at inflated prices? Right? The whole world. And that whole world included Joseph's brothers. <laughs> now, I know exactly why Joseph did what he did. But he, what he's going to do is he's going to help his brother out. But they don't recognize him. And the reason they don't recognize him is because Hebrews are all hairy. They never shave or anything. And, uh, and during this time, Egyptians shaved every part of their body. So they didn't recognize him. And he'd grown up, you know, he got bigger. So they come before him, and he, he plays with them. You know, he hides expensive things in their bags, and then he sends his officers to go and, and uh, catch him and say, hey, you stole this stuff, and then puts one of them in jail and tells him, well, you have to bring your brother and say, oh, no, you can't bring my younger, they have another younger brother, Benjamin, now. We can't bring, because if, if something happened to him, our father would just be dead because something happened to uh, his other favorite son. Well, finally, um, they have a reunion after they're all there, and Joseph reveals who he is. And he says this. He says, what you meant for ill, God meant for good. Right? 
So a lot of times when we're in bad situations, we just have to remember that, that God means it for good. And he says that other places in the Bible, too. So now they are all in Egypt, and they do very well for years. They are multiplying much faster than the Egyptians because, you know, God's on their side. And uh, so they're, mul they're getting bigger and bigger, and finally, it's been 300 years, they forgot all about Joseph, and the Pharaoh doesn't like it that they ha are so powerful. And he starts treating them poorly. And now they want to leave. And this is a story you know about Moses, who, you know, is raised up, and, and he finally gets his people out of Egypt. But the way they do that is through these plagues, and the final plague is the plague of the firstborn child is going to die. How many of you here are firstborn children? Yeah. I'm not. Sorry, you're all dead. <laughs> but unless you put the blood of a lamb over your doorpost, and then the angel of death will pass over that doorpost and not kill the firstborn child. That's the beginning of the Passover. Right? Every year, Jews celebrate this. I always say that Jews, um, every celebration Jews have, it has they eat their history by eating food, which I think is a great idea. <laughs> the second thing is, all of their celebrations are, somebody tried to kill us, God saved us, let's eat. That's every celebration for a Jew. Check it out. And so they uh, celebrate this Passover every single year, right in the spring. Well, as you saw in the lesson today, Jesus is celebrating a Passover meal with his disciples. And this is important for us to get because you remember a lamb was slaughtered and the blood of the lamb was put over the doorpost and that saved people, right? Jesus is now going to offer himself as the lamb of God and he's going to offer his blood to save you, right? This is Jesus connecting the history of the Jewish people with what he's doing on the cross. And he's doing this just before he dies on the cross. And at this meal, he says, this is, is, okay, this is my body. This is my blood. He doesn't say this is kind of like my body. He doesn't say this is sort of my blood. He says this is my blood. And for 1,500 years, the church has taken that seriously. And they have said that this communion is Christ's body and blood. 500 years ago, some people came along, Anabaptists, who said, well, no, no, what we want to emphasize is something different. Now I want to share with you how the three ways that churches look at communion. And you're going to see how this plays out. So first we have the Catholics. The Catholics say, if you go to a Catholic service, uh, at a certain point when the when the priest raises the bread or raises the wine, you're going to hear a bell. Ding, 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 ding. And at that point, they believe that this becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. In fact, in church, in Catholic churches, on the back wall, they usually see something called the tabernacle, which is where they would put the unused bread in there because it's been blessed, and then they'll use it at the next service. That's why, this is one reason I wouldn't mind being a Catholic, the Catholic priest has to drink all the wine. <laughs> it's a pretty good deal, right? Uh, anyway, so it does, it, they call this transubstantiation. The substance transforms into the body and the blood of Christ. Okay? Now I'm going to give you the um, Reformed position. And they focus on, um, do this in remembrance of me. So they say that every time we have communion, we're remembering what happened back there, but it doesn't actually become the body and blood of Christ. We're just remembering that event. And that remembering is powerful. It's not like that's insignificant. In fact, the disciples of Christ celebrate the um, Eucharist every single week. So it's not insignificant to them. It just they don't buy into the fact that it becomes Christ's body and blood. Now comes along Luther, and he says, well, you know, I don't really think it changes substance. I think it's still bread and wine. I think anybody can see that. 
And he says, uh, but Christ is in, he uses these words, in, with, and under the bread and the wine. So that when you take Christ, when you take the body, and, when you take the bread and the wine, you are taking Christ's body and blood into your life, and he is becoming a part of you. So those are the three understandings of communion. Now, I think you could take all three of those and put them together and come up with a pretty good understanding of what this is. And it's probably a whole lot more than any of us could describe, and certainly me here today. But that when you are taking Christ's body into your life, you're taking Christ into you. He is now a part of you. And that's why this is so significant to us, and that's why we do it every week. Now, when I was in seminary, you know, we were arguing about whether children could take communion or not. And uh, I remember one time I was, maybe I wasn't, but one of my friends was giving the communion. We had a common cup. And a little kid in his parents' arms was going, do you see Jesus in there? Now, I would suggest to you that's a better understanding of what that is than most of the adults in the room had. So I think kids should take communion at every age because it's also a family meal, and we're all part of a family, and it doesn't seem right to me that little kids are left out of the family meal. Does it seem right to you? When you have a meal at home, do you tell kids they can't eat? Maybe they aren't going to like what you have, but you, can't you don't tell them they can't eat. So that's an important thing. So this whole communion thing is really, really important. It has been for you know, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church have all emphasized this as being essential to who we are. When I was in uh, Israel, there was a, a, a church at the place where Jesus did the... Uh, supposedly, where Jesus did the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, there, was a, um, there was a mosaic there that was from a long, long time ago. And that mosaic was actually this mosaic here. I got this there. And uh, on this, it, it was right, and the mosaic was right underneath the altar. And uh, they had a, a two fish now, Jesus had the fish, the five loaves and the two fish, and then a basket with four loaves in it. Now, that's probably not the way you remember this story, right? Four loaves. But for them, um, the early church, the, uh, the, four lo the fifth loaf was the one on the table that they were going to serve. And that meant that in the early church, this whole communion thing meant that we take this body and this blood and it goes out into the whole world and gets shared with the whole world. That was what they took from communion. So communion's really important, and it's essential to who we are, and it's why we do communion every single week and why you should partake in this, because this is a gift given to you, um, and it also means that Christ is in you, which is uh, your salvation. Remember we talked about how uh, the first thing we need to do as Christians is sit with Christ in the heavenly places. And this is one way we do that. We take the body and the blood of Christ, and he is, sits within us. And as Jesus is in us, changes us to be more and more like him. And uh, remember we talked about uh, it's important for us to admit our sins, that we're sinners. And uh, this is the, the cool thing about Christianity is that Christ recognizes we're sinners like the children's sermon, but uh, comes into our lives anyway, our sinful lives, and starts changing us from the inside out so that we don't call our brother terrible names. <laughs> like my wife just did. I'm sure I would never do something like that. Anyway, so that's the, uh, that's the whole story of communion, and I hope... It's more powerful to you each time you take it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for coming to us uh, in your body and your blood. The early church, uh, people heard this body and blood stuff, and they thought, we, we thought Christians, early Christians, were cannibals. But we're not cannibals. We're taking your life into ours. 
and you are blessing us every single day. So I pray, Lord, that you would take our sinful hearts, our sinful lives, and that you would make them anew so that we are more and more like you each and every day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. should be on um, your paper that has a scripture on it. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Jesus Christ and for all people according to their needs. Lord, we pray today for some people who are sick and in need of your healing hand. We pray for David Lind and ask for your continued healing for him. We pray for Mark Long, who's been in the hospital on a ventilator for the last week, and we pray your healing especially on him and to be with him. We pray for Heidi Pfeiffer's dad, who had a stroke this last week, and ask for your healing. We continue to pray for Dick Oshner, for Carolyn, for Shirley Yauk, for Bev Sheridan, John Olson, Meryl Tregoni, and Diane Bruner. We pray for people who are grieving the loss of uh, loved ones as well. We pray for, uh, for Diane, for uh, Glenn's family at the loss of Diane, and we pray for the Gasland family at the loss of Danielle. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those, uh, especially with COVID ramping up with this new uh, variant, we ask that you would especially be with those who are working in hospitals tirelessly and in rest homes. Be with those employees and give them a special strength to meet the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we pray for this church and its future growth, and we pray for the, that that uh, we would be wise in finding a new pastor, and that pastor would um, faithfully serve you and faithfully serve the people of this church. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I just want to remind you there is an offering. We don't take offering anymore, but there's a red box over here and there's an offering over there. And I want to thank you for being so generous through this whole time. You guys have just really stepped up. And I tell you, it makes it so much easier as a staff and as a council that um, you guys have been so great about this. So thank you so much.
On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Come as you are ushered forward. Princes and paupers, sons and daughters, heal at the throne of grace. Losers and winners, saints and sinners, one day will see his face.
Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Shall we stand for our closing song? Right. 
his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we will. Have a great week.